I thought in these unprecedented times um, I would make a bit of an effort to do some additional videos um, and what to do them on is always is always quite a difficult choice. One thing which seems to be um, requested more often than not is for me to do some editing and of course that's really easy to do for me at home. I can just record the screen which is how I'm, I'm doing this right now and I can take you through uh, the, the editing of a, of a basic landscape photo. Okay. Um, I'm throwing a bunch of these out for free over this period of lockdown, um, really just to help you all along, give you things to do. Maybe we can all learn something from each other in all sorts of directions, but here's one of my um, contributions, if you like, and um, this one is going to be, and I'll do two or three others, I think, um, just to put on the um, channel there for you to watch at your leisure. If you do want to do something more one-to-one, -one, I am going to set up a, a Skype system, um, hopefully do that in the next couple of days, so that people can join me one-to-one uh, -one or two-to-one -one or whatever you can do with Skype. I think you can go multiples. And we can have Q&A sessions, we can just have general chats, we can kick around the topics, we can dance around architecture, we can do what you like, okay? Um, and depending on what the content of that is, is um, whether or not you um, you sort of have to sort of book or hire me for that it depends really. Um, but yeah, make contact um, either in the comments below or direct to me if you already have direct contact or through the website or whatever. So let's dive into this as we always say on YouTube. Um, my editing is not particularly complex. I think sometimes people get the impression, and I pick that up from comments made to me, that I do a lot of editing, that some of my images are heavily edited. Now, I can tell you, as far as post-processing is, post -processing is concerned, uh, less is more for me, uh, and I really don't. And hopefully you'll sort of see that as we go through this image. Now, what you see in front of you is nothing particularly special. It's a, a particular scene I spotted when I was crossing the river here in Snowdonia at the Watkin Path and um, what I decided to do was just take this shot handheld pointing back down through the river to obviously you can see the mountain there in the distance and we had a relatively nice moody sky. The light is crap, um, it's very flat although there was some interesting drama going on as you can see up there in the sky but it left the whole image um, pretty flat so there's only so much I can do with this. I wish the foreground was was lit more interestingly but it isn't it is what it is so let's see what we can do with it okay um right where do i start where i normally start is i look at the aspect ratio and i look at the crop um some people do that last i don't i think it's uh, a waste of time to be editing areas which are just going to dump in the end anyway so the first thing i'll look at is that and i'll also be checking the horizons and things like this so this needs a little bit of straightening so let's go to that first because we can see this uh, little, it's not a plank, it's not wood, it's a slab of uh, stone uh, bridge. It's not quite level and that will annoy me, so I need to straighten that up. Always straighten your horizons and lines, guys. There's nothing worse, and I mean this not in a um, uh, critical way, but just as an observational comment. Nothing worse than seeing uh, a nice landscape where they haven't bothered to straighten the lines, verticals or horizontals. It just, it jumps out. Um, it's quite distracting to the eye in some ways. So one should always do that. So that's nice and level now and a little bit happier by that straight away. Now let's secondary, let's think about the crop. The way that I filled the frame when I composed this was to bring this rock and this particular down here, this little S-shaped swirl of bubbling brook into the frame. So I really want to keep, I don't really want to lose any of that. Equally, I have a nice dramatic sky, which I don't want to lose either. So. Often I will crop these to 8 by 5 but I'm going to leave this one as. I think that um, although it would be an odd shaped print if it were printed, it um, I think works in this particular way and so it could be used as a web print or uh, a magazine, potentially magazine cover or something like that if need be. So it's got a use. So once we've had a look at the crop and we've straightened things out, my next thing I would normally do would be to look at the, I tend to use Lightroom starting from the top down which is actually how it's designed anyway. Um, and what I would do is I would um, go into the uh, original or the top primary develop panel which has your exposure, temperature, tint and so on. And I would start with my exposure of course 
and I would adjust whites and blacks trying to get the colour balance correct and the shadows and the highlights to complement each other in a realistic way. Now let's just take a step back before we actually adjust any sliders and talk about, for those of you that may not understand this, dynamic range and why this particular image is dark in the foreground. You could argue, and you would not be incorrect to argue, that the foreground is actually underexposed, and it is, probably by about a stop, stop and a half. But that's because I'm a bit old school and I still photograph um, exposing for the highlights, which is, a, which was a common thing back with film. So that I retain 99, if not all of my percent on all of my uh, detail in the sky in this particular case. And these other highlighted areas like the reflection here from the stream and the whiteness of the flowing water, which is always important to keep your eye on because if you blow that out, Again, like some areas of sky, it's non-recoverable. And you really do want, if I zoom into 200, you see this nice texture in the movement of the water. You don't want to lose that. If you blow that out, you'll lose it. Um, just a note on shutter speeds whilst we're looking in close to that piece of water. Uh, as a personal preference, I don't like to do super long exposures. I don't even own a 10 stop. Uh, it's just not for me. Um, I'm not criticizing that in any way. And anybody can do what they like. I just personally see so much of it out there that I feel that one should be trying to do something a bit different um, because otherwise we get stuck in ruts and we you know we don't really experiment and do things. So a little tip, you can see from the um, data up here in the top right hand corner, it's a 15th of a second. I always shoot flowing water between uh, roughly about an eighth of a second and maybe a 20th of a second because I want this, this movement, this texture to stay in it, okay? So a little tip for you. Um, I'm 99% as well shoot handheld. Um, I did notice somebody made a comment on YouTube the other day which made me stick my tongue in the side of my cheeks to say that landscape photographers who say they don't use tripods are virtue signaling. Now, <laughs> I'm not gonna argue with that because I don't wanna get down those rabbit holes but it did make me chuckle. Um, it's not virtue signaling, guys. Some of us just genuinely prefer to shoot in particular ways and I like to shoot handheld, and I like to rely on my um, image stabilization in my lens. Um, I should take a, a moment to explain why, I suppose, because I like the creative freedom of having the flexibility of the camera in the hand, and I use my body and my eye and perspective and my positioning to gain my, um, uh, compose my shot, because I feel very restricted, very planted by a, by a, by a tripod, and, I, and that, that actually, I feel it stifles my creativity. Okay, for me it's much easier if you can imagine I'm looking through my viewfinder, I've got this scene, and if you look down here in the corners where I've purposely framed certain parts of the composition look, and I've left room around these areas to breathe in the frame, okay, I can do that very, very quickly. I wish I could actually emphasize this with this photo, but I can't do it. But I'm moving around, almost hovering if you like, and then when I get it, I pause, I stop breathing, it comes from an old military, um, technique from when you're sharpshooting, when you're sniping, you, you, you do something with your breathing and you steady yourself and click, I hit the shot. And then I'm free to move on again. I can quickly flick it to back to a landscape um, orientation if I want. I can do whatever I want. Or I can spin around and do that. I don't feel planted. I really don't like the whole ceremony of setting up a tripod and being stuck in that spot and standing back and waiting. That's not the way I do things. Nothing wrong with that. It's just, I thought I'd explain why I would say I don't use a tripod. It's not an elitist thing or a virtue signaling thing. It's because it's just the way I operate. And I'm happy with my productivity and my output because of the way that I do that. When I return from a photo walk or trip, I feel I've got a lot more diversity in my can, let's call it that, of shots because I've had so much flexibility. I don't take a lot more photos than somebody else but I get a lot more perspectives, angles, and I do a lot more uh, variation in composition because I'm so much more free, okay? So try it, just go out once and try that and see if you prefer it or not. Many of you won't, but anyway, went off down a uh, bit of a tangent there, or off on a tangent. So, so let's go back to where we were. We were talking about the exposure. So the lower the half, lower half of this is um, underexposed quite rightly because I've exposed for the highlights at the top. So the first thing we need to do is just look at our exposure. I use the histogram as a guide. Um, I won't go into the depths of how you read a histogram or anything. I'm going to assume you know that. If not, pop me a question and I'll be happy to explain. But I can see that I'm quite heavy to the left for obvious reasons. About four-fifths of my image is 
in shadow for the most part. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to gently lift the exposure and push it as far as I dare before I'm, I'm watching, you know, making sure I'm not clipping over here. I'm just watching to see how far I can push my exposure to bring up that foreground, you see? Now you could argue, and you'd be right too, that I could have done a better job when I exposed this at the time because perhaps I could have um, dropped my shutter speed down to stop or, uh, you know, about to stop look, and I could have got this anyway. But, you know, like I said, I'm on the move. And um, as long as I'm there or thereabouts, we can always make tweaks in post-processing. Nothing wrong with that. So I've done that, but equally I want to just make sure I'm controlling my highlights. I've got quite a hot spot here and here. So I'm just going to come to highlights and just, just make sure I've got a handle on that. You also see on the left-hand side of the histogram, I'm not in full shadow anywhere. I don't mind being in full shadow, and we'll look at that in a moment. So I've done my exposure. I'm not going to touch contrast right now, um, even though I've washed it out a little bit more from the raw image by lifting the exposure. We'll look at that later with the um, tone curve. We've touched on highlights. We might need to come back to that later. The next thing is the shadow. So do we need to lift the shadows anymore? Well, let's just play. Sometimes it's just about having a play and seeing how things look. So I'm just going to, I'm just playing with the shadow. I'm just, I do like this pulsing thing where I, I look to see and then I'll settle about there. I think that's okay. Bear in mind at the moment it looks washed out. The colour's very, very um, muted because this is still the raw image well, until I push the colour. So I've done my shadows. So, my next, so as you can see, I'm logically going down the panel here and I'm making the corrections um, not only from a creative but also a technically um, correct exposure point of view. Whites and blacks. So this is quite important. This is something I always do with every image. And if you're not familiar with this process, I don't know if you use a Mac. I don't know what the keys are on uh, Windows. Um, I do apologize. I'm sure you can find out. But if you click on the slider and hold down your mouse button as you do so, which is what you have to do to grab it, to move it, and then you hold down Alt on uh, a Mac, you see the whole image goes black. Now, as I push this out, you'll see the white areas blow out. So that's just giving me, if you like, a mask to show me where I'm overexposing. And what I'll do is I'll just push my white until I get the first little pinprick, which you can see is about there. I don't actually, I don't actually like this bright patch, but it's a bit distracting, but that's what Mother Nature gave me. So I go back to the whites and you see I've got a little pinprick in that position. And now I know I've got one perfect white point. And then I want to do the opposite with black. So I've got a perfect black point. And then I know that my entire image that the entire grayscale scope goes from perfect white to perfect black, and I know that that's balanced. So we'll go to blacks, do the same thing, click and hold, hold alt, this time it goes to um, white, and you can see I've already got something showing up there. You see as I drag that down, those are the pure blacks beginning to show through. If I go to the extreme, it'll go really bad, but I don't want that, I just want to take it so the image is starting to show in the deepest of shadows black, and I think that'll do off. And now I know that's balanced. Okay, nice little tip there to do that. Make sure you use those masks just by holding down Alt or Option key, and that'll help me do that. I'm moving down the panel to Presence. I won't touch texture, clarity, or dehaze at this point, or even vibrance and saturation. For me, those are finishing sliders, and also don't forget that they're global, which means they will affect the entire image. And one tip for the the individual who's moving into Lightroom and hoping to sort of start to get some level of advanced skills in Lightroom, you want to start w operating into um, parts and sections of your image rather than doing everything with global sliders. Okay, you can do it like that. There's nothing wrong with it. In, in many cases, it gives a nice result. But really, as you want to, if you want to start building your knowledge and your understanding and your and your craft of um, post processing in the Lightroom as opposed to the darkroom. You want to um, start thinking about dodging and burning and working on particular areas, which we'll do some of. So let's close that first panel down. I don't need that anymore for now. I would normally go to tone curve at this point, but I'm going to leave that till last because what I'll normally do is I like to take take it easy with images like this, flat images, and I might just pop on, I'll just show you now, I'll just pop on medium contrast like that, but it's still too much at this point, but that's the sort of thing I would normally do. So now I'm going to move on. So I've done my basics, now I'm moving on to colour. So that's the HSL and colour panel. And we've got our three areas, our hue, our saturation, and our luminance. All are important in an image like this. Hue allows you to change the hue, or for those who aren't familiar with that, if you like the 
the, the, the range of colour within colour, I like to call it that sometimes. So if I throw hue on and I pick, this is pretty flat, but we've got some greens in there. Let's zoom into these greens so you can see what I'm going to do. All right, these greens between the bars of the little fence there down here. And if I grab the green hue and I move it left to right, you will see that well, it goes to that. If I push it over to the right, a horrible, yucky, sicky, alieny green colour. And over to the extreme left, it sort of goes very flat and it's pushing a sort of a ruddy brown with some green yellow in it, it's hard to say really. Um, and you can decide um, how, well, you could be creative and artistic and completely abstract and do that sort of thing with a green if you want. Or um, what I try to do is I try to, I've got quite a good memory, forgive the pun, photographic type memory, and I can, I can place myself back here and I can remember what it felt like visually and what it you know so the colors the tones the hues and things and what i just tend to do is try to recall that or recreate that should i say so i remember it not being particularly green green like this is showing and the camera sensor has given me and the editing thus far has pushed out because the, even the edits i've done so far will have changed that color slightly and i'll move it back with the hue to something well what i what i remember and it was more of a a brownie you know it's at high relative altitude it's been windswept and it's not quite as lush a green as it as normal grass at lowland would be i'll do the same with yellow and orange because as you can see through the image these are the sort of colors we're seeing so i'll play with yellow and you'll again you'll see that see that change it goes from a greeny across to more of a brown that was more toward the brown there and orange will do the same look it goes flat and again it's pushing almost a greeny mucky color there and then over there, it's more of a rich um, orange to red. But we need to move it to what it really looked like, which is about there. I'm going to zoom out a minute because you can't really appreciate that because it's a little bit in the distance. Um, and so I've done that. A hue of blue, I don't really need to touch. The water looks pretty accurate, actually. It was melt water. There was a lot of snow up top. I'd been up top the previous day, uh, on top to Snowden, I should say. In the, in the, and it was snow and ice and it was rapidly melting so we had a really nice sort of aqua blue meltwater color so all i'll do with that is probably increase the saturation in just a minute you can see it's still a nice sort of aqua color anyway now we'll go to saturation then i finish with those with the colors that i've got in the image i'm only working on the colors that i've got in the image no point in doing the others which is why i don't use overall saturation right i hope that makes sense so back to green um now I will zoom in again on this so I can see this and I just want to check that the saturation of what I'm playing with is on par to what I saw about there. Same with the yellow. In most cases these are going to go to the right and I'm pushing them because of course I'm restoring colour to a washed out raw file. And the same about there. Now I've got to watch this because there's a lot of red and orange in some of these rocks and I don't want to overemphasize or falsify what was really there. So as you can see we're getting there, we're starting to see some colour now. And I will go back sometimes at this point and just use the vibrant slider a little bit and then a touch of saturation now that I've got my colours kind of tuned for want of a better word. So I've got them tuned and now I can just push them to make them look more attractive. You see how in particular, look at this rock in the foreground, just watch how that starts to punch out the colour. Yeah. Now I bring it to something like it looked and I'm going to drop those oranges again in a minute because they've now pushed themselves too up but when we look at the rock and we know that we know roughly what color the, the lichen and that is it's starting to look correct now we're too much on that orange now because I pushed it too much in HSL this is what editing's like it's a, got a lot to do with fiddling there you go just just to settle it down a bit it's looking a bit too orange and it didn't look natural it didn't look what it looked like when i was there so finally luminance now luminance is where we uh, luminance luminosity you know what those things are um part of the name of my favorite art period from the 1800s the um uh, the luminance period where most of the famous landscape pictures that we might remember the painting should I say that we might remember were painted where there was some brilliant use of in particular whites and light colors to recreate lighting on, on painted landscapes and um, luminism was the name of that period should I say 
and that's what that reminds me of. So if we come into luminance and we start looking at the image again, it's probably prudent to go in tight, but probably not quite that tight. Hold on, I'm just going to go to one to one. Um, and now we're just going to push the luminance of red, orange, and green again. Sorry, orange, yellow, and green again, and get our punch. You see how that's lifting to something more like it really looked like? Yeah, just a little bit, not too much. I'm just going to check the blue and aqua if I really need to lift that. I don't think so. Aqua might need a little bit of. Yeah, you see, if I. I'm just going to show you this. Look in this area here. If I push the luminosity in the blue, I almost get a glare effect, and I don't want that. So I want to actually push that the other way. Okay, it's attention to detail, guys. That's what makes things a little bit better. So this is starting to come together. We're now starting to get a bit of punch in the image. You can see the colors being drawn out of it. The sky's about right. I'm going to work on that a little bit in a minute to give it a touch more drama. But um, and then I'm going to go into dodging and burning, and, and I'll talk about that when I do it because that's important um, to think about tonal balance of an image. So let's just go to the sky. What I normally do with my skies is I use the adjustment brush and I apply clarity to skies because it brings out the detail um, and, and the contrast between light and dark areas of cloud and it can often give it a punch. You must be careful here though guys, if you overcook it, it will look horrible. So um, I open up a brush, I apply the clarity option and mine's sort of locked at about 60, 63, that should be about 60. But what I'll also apply as I brush is some noise reduction because as I disturb the sky with editing, I will generate noise and so I might as well deal with it whilst I brush. So that's just a me thing. So I'm gonna do that and as you can see as I do this, there's this, it's quite subtle, but the sky is just developing a little bit more, let's call it anger, all right? You see that, in fact, it's a little bit heavy and I will drop that back a touch. I must be careful not to go into the tree line if I can help it because I will cause artifacts with the very far, I'll, I'll zoom in on that in a minute and show you. Um, if that's a little bit too much, I'm gonna drop that back. I'm gonna push the noise a little bit more. But I don't wanna, I'm, I'm happy with the exposure of the sky. I'm gonna leave that there. The only thing I'm not happy with, I think it's got a little bit too much blue in it. Um, so I might drop the saturation just to affect that. You see how I did that? If I drop it all the way out, it goes it's all black and white. So I just want to drop it a bit. Mm -hmm. With me while I just... Okay, that'll do for now. I say this is a bit quick and dirty, so I'm not really going to spend all the amount of time I would normally would to make this um, super good. Now, I'll close that down. I'm just going to zoom in on the... and then show you what these artifacts, because these are going to be here whatever I do. Now, because this is in a distance, it's not quite as sharp as the, re as the rest of the image, but you can see the haloing and the cr chromatic aberration on these on the, the tops of these um, trees, on these, these very fine branches. Okay, that looks horrible. Now, perhaps I should have done this at the beginning. Um, if you're familiar with the lens correction panel, what you can do is you can click remove chromatic aberration and you should see a change in this. It might not completely deal with it, but it's pretty good in Lightroom. Wow, did you see the difference there? Just look at this area here. Keep your eye on it, and I turn this on and off. See the change? Now that's an artifact caused by the lens. It's just a matter of physics. Not much we can do about it. Very expensive lenses tend to do less of that, but um, we can get rid of it, okay? So that's cleaning, that's part of the cleaning routine of an image. Often I would do that as part of looking for dust bunnies and, and taking those out as well. And we might as well also, while we're at it, click Enable Profile Correction. What that will do is that the um, program will recognize the lens I used and it will just make a slight adjustment um, to it to correct any distortion that is pre-programmed into this software that uh, the software knows about the particular lens I used. As you can see, it's identified it over here. I used a Tamron uh, 24-70 to F2.8 and it knew all that and it dealt with it for me automatically, so that's good. So even zoomed out to 
where we are now, we can see that looks much cleaner up there, much better. And there will also have been some other fringing, perhaps on the top of the horizon, the mountain against the sky, which we didn't spot. And in high contrast areas like under the underside of this bridge, where it goes from so dark to much lighter, it would have dealt with that too. So we're, we're almost there, really. Um, I could do a lot more with it. And I, in fact, I probably wouldn't leave this image finished like this. I probably would uh, play with it a little bit more. Uh, I would do things like um, whiten or lighten up the water areas a bit more so they, they are a little bit more obvious. Um, I would drop the blue in those areas of water a bit more. Um, but what I'm going to do um, next, which is quite important to show you, um, is to show you how I would sharpen. Now, I often do a lot of my sharpening in, in Photoshop. I would uh, export this to Photoshop. But I'll show you how I do my sharpening in Lightroom for that a bit, because it's, it's pretty good these days. It didn't used to be so good, but um, it's all right now. So if we look at just sharpening, let's close that panel there. Sharpening in general, um, you just do it by eye. You know, pick a, pick a section on the, I mean, the focal point for sharpness really on this one is either this rock or this rock. So let's just jump on this one, let's zoom in on that. And we can also zoom in on that on, uh, oops, on the main image up here in the little thing little spyglass and then let's just it's pretty sharp anyway because although it's raw it will be soft but it's pretty darn good for a raw image it's a good lens um, and I'm just gonna just drag that until I am happy this is you know add to taste until I'm happy that it's sharp enough but not over sharpened and I'll show you how we can check that in a moment that for me is pretty good now how can we check for over sharpening Zoom out and go to those fine sort of places that we looked at before where we did the detail uh, that we removed the chromatic aberration. And if I had gone too sharp, I would see strong halos, which is a white banding, if you like, around some of these finer, thin, contrasty areas. And um, I'm not seeing that. It does look a little bit soft and blurry on some of these, but you'll have to realise that I shot well under a second of shutter speed. So this just would have been wobbling in the wind. And that's why that's blurry equally in the same way that the water's blurred out, uh, motioned out as well. Radius, always stick that to about one as a rule of thumb. Okay, and detail again, you can add that to taste. Um, it's not gonna make a huge amount of difference, but you can throw a bit in just to give it a little bit more crispness. Um, and then the masking tool. Do you know about the masking tool? Um, works a similar way to the black and white <clears throat> that I did. Hold and click on it. Hold down Alt, my keyboard wasn't connected, let it talk to the machine, okay. The image will go all white, and as I move it to the right, you will see the image start to appear in this sort of white, what does he call it, halo-y outline, outline way. And basically, whatever's bright white is gonna be sharpened. So if I go right over to the right, the minimum amount of that image is sharpened. Right over to the left, all of it is gonna be affected by sharpening. Now you see that there's an effect in the sky. I don't want that because that's going to make my sky look horrible. So I at least want to move to I'm not sharpening into the sky. So that's gone look. And I'd probably go a little bit more so I only really am sharpening the key hard areas of the image. And that way I don't over sharpen it across the board. Let go of everything. And that's the mask applied. So it's now only, it's not sharpening in the sky so much in the water, but on the areas that we want it to be sharpened, it's looking pretty damn good now, right? Although I don't know what the quality would be like over the recording, because I'm looking at this on a 5K Retina 27-inch Mac, and you'll be looking at it on what a YouTube 720p, um, highly rendered uh, video. So I'm sure it won't look as, as sharp as it's looking to me. But trust me, it's tack. Um, as far as noise reduction is concerned, I shot this at ISO 64, so I don't really need, but I always do. I was taught this when I did my. Um, my lecturer taught me this when I was doing year one of a degree in photography and he said you should always put a tiny smidgen of um, noise reduction in and I, and I don't know why he never really explained it he said because there's always noise I guess and, and I've always I've just kept it as a habit a tiny bit now so you can zoom in on this and it's as clean as a whistle everywhere there's just no noise it, it was shot with a Nikon D810 Nikon if you call it that um, I think it's a fantastic camera um, I'm not a a big one for branding of things and talking about camera brands it doesn't really matter but it's just very good for clean images especially at the really low ISOs. 
ISOs. Right, um, the last thing I'm just going to show you is a bit of dodging and burning and why I would do it. Now, what's really important in an image like this is to use dodging and burning, if you can, to help to lead the eye to where you want the eye to go. And in this case, I, I guess it's, you know, we obviously, uh, our eye is drawn to the foreground here and we're walking through the image with our eye. We're going down the stream, over the bridge, or under the bridge rather, and out into the landscape. Now, we can help the eye with that. If you look at the bottom corners, both sides, it's a little bit bright, a bit brighter than I would like it. And also, I'm a bit distracted by this very bright spot, dead bang in the middle. This rock in particular is very bright. It's catching what little light there was and so is that spot there in the water. So I would go to uh, my brush tool, and, I, and this is the thing that I do most of in my editing, I do a lot of dodging and burning, which is an old method from the darkroom, but done digitally here. So I'd select uh, my, my brush and I would just jump into, I want to darken in this case, so that's burning. Select the burn tool. So I'd usually go a little bit over, underexposed, over, is that even a word, over? Underexposed quite a lot and then back it off later because it helps me to see where I've applied it. So I take my brush and what I want to do is I just want to darken some of these areas here. Oh my computer's taking a bit of time to think it shouldn't do. It's not as if it's running many programs. But anyway I'm just going to darken that. It's quite subtle and I'll turn this on and off in a minute and you'll see how it made a difference. A little bit in here, a little bit down here, some people might use a vignette for this, but I think a vignette's too hit and miss. You want to be more precise. You see, um, I've done that, and also I'm going to zoom in and make my brush smaller, and I'm going to take a bit off of this bit in the middle because it's a bit too distracting, too bright. Okay, and I've just gone over a little bit on that hot spot there in the water. Can you see it? Oh, let me turn it on and off and you'll see the difference. Yeah, so all I've done is help the eye to be drawn in down through the centre of the image by dodging, rather by burning, well by dodging and burning, you can do both. Um, some people might want to uh, dodge this side of the rock to bring that out a little bit, or this area in here. I might do that if I had more time. And I might also take to some areas of the sky whilst I've got a brush applied. I'm just going to paint a bit. I'm going to do this a bit loosely, guys. I'm just going to paint a little bit at the top here, almost like I'd used a, um, a filter, a grad, but I didn't because I don't enjoy using grads. Again, it's not a snobbery thing. Um, if I'd used a grad here, it would have um, affected the exposure to the top of the tree uh, and, of course, the sky, and then how I'd have to somehow fix that. I would rather, as I said right at the beginning, expose to the highlights then I can use a digital process to um, bring down the uh, exposure or the highlights in the sky if I need to. And that way I haven't interfered with things like trees or mountains or irregular shapes on the horizon. Um, and the final thing I'm going to do, just for a little bit of add to taste, is um, just push the saturation up a half a stop just to finish off really. And I think that'll do. I would um, often go into Photoshop and do a little bit of additional sharpening if I felt it was appropriate. But other than that, that's a basic walkthrough. I don't know how long that took. I'll see in a minute. I imagine it was somewhere between 15 and 20 minutes. Um, and that was a long one because I did it slowly whilst I was explaining everything to you guys. Um, let's go to F to see full picture. To start with, take your time. You only cost a fortune, computer. There we go. Um, and you can see an overall. It's not. It's not a particular favourite of mine. I think it works. Um, it's okay. Um, I wish it was better light, as I said earlier. Um, and if we just do a comparison, which is why on the keyboard, we can see what a difference we made. Yeah. So there's no real jiggery pokery. There's no composite going on there. There's no fancy pants, um, lying type uh, post processing. It's just making the most of the file and bring it back which is what you're seeing on the right there after to what I actually saw. My camera cannot create what I actually saw because its dynamic range is less than my naked eye. And so all I've done there is increase the, uh, yeah, could increase the dynamic range by mainly means of lifting the shadows and giving the color back. And I've presented you now with what 
I actually saw rather than what the camera can give me. All right, so I hope you enjoyed that. I hope it was useful. I will do more. Um, I'll have to think of different types of images so that I approach them in different ways to make it interesting. Um, I think a good idea might be to do a black and white and show you how I convert to black and white. And um, I'll have to think about that because I've built presets since my days of doing it all manually. So I'll have to go back to, to scratch. But hope you enjoyed it. And um, yeah, I'll pop this up on the channel uh, immediately. It'll only take me 10 minutes to do that. And um, if you want to watch it, you may. Enjoy and take care and stay safe. Try not to catch bugs and um, be great to each other. Don't overbuy everything down the supermarket. Remember, we all got to get through this together. Take care. Bye-bye.